Okay, it's going to be a review of No Mercy 2006. This is a SmackDown brand pay-per-view. We have uh, Booker T as champion as King Booker, you know, with Charmel on the cover. Awesome cover right there. It looks like, uh, you know, the cover of a Disney movie or, or a fairy tale. But I was happy for Booker T. But, you know, the, the show didn't really do that well in terms of uh, buys. Uh, apparently, there was some fear about the buy rate in Booker T with a one-on-one -on -one match against Lashley. So they beefed it up. And put, uh, you know, Batista in the four way, you know, just to, you know, ensure that the pay per view wouldn't do, do awful. Um, but underrated show. I, I thought it was a good show. A lot of guys have, have stated that, you know, even No Mercy 06 was a quality show. There's, you know, some must see stuff on here. I, I was wrong about it. Uh, you know, I was under the impression that this is a one match show and, you know, SmackDown started to, uh, you know, suck around this time once again. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I, I would definitely say this is another, you know, quality show from 2006. Uh, but I want to get to that in a second, man. So we're going all the way back to October 8th, 2006. This is from Raleigh, North Carolina, the home of the Hardys RBC Center. We have 9,000 in attendance. Good crowd, good atmosphere. Um, very lively event. Uh, the buy rate did do pretty bad, though. They do 197,000 buys. Um, so without a doubt, you know, the worst buy rate, I think, in No Mercy history in terms of, you know, when they actually used to calculate buy rates. 16 and 17, those are network shows. So definitely the worst buy rate for a No Mercy. Uh, I'm going to say the worst buy rate of 2006. I'm not going to count ECW. Uh, the ECW show is a, uh, you know, legit WWE pay-per-view. So, you know, a lot of things working against this show. Uh, you know, th th just to give you an example, my brother was a huge Booker T fan, I think at first, but he wasn't a big fan of this gimmick. I think, you know, you could slowly see a lot of guys just not buy into it. Uh, for as good of a job as Booker T did with this gimmick, I, I just I just feel like it wasn't, you know, the Booker T that we all know and love. I just feel like it really wasn't the real guy, you know, that we got to see during the invasion or, you know, even going back to WCW. Uh, but the bottom line is him and Charmel did an awesome job with what they had to give. But, you know, this is just Booker T adapting, you know, to what Vince McMahon wanted. But, uh, you know, quality show right here. You know, I, I obviously I was looking forward to the Benoit, you know, and Regal match. You know, you knew that was going to be good. That's really the only thing I could remember, uh, you know, from the show being quality. But what I forgot was how, how good this undercard was. Just, just a quality show. So you can make an argument that this is, you know, one of the more consistent shows of the year. And yeah, I'm going to give it a thumbs up. I'm going to say, uh, oh, once again, another good show from 2006, which is a year everybody trashes. And it's funny. It's funny. Like when you compare it to 1998, like there's so many guys that think 98 was the best year ever. You know, if you ask Jim Ross, you ask Austin, you, you even ask some of the fans on here like, oh, 98 was the best year. Um but I'll, I'll tell you what, though, if you if you compare 98 to 2006, like pay-per-view for pay-per-view in terms of match by match, I hate to say it, man, but 06 probably blows 98 away in, in a lot of different ways. But um, I think the thing about 2006 that stands out, I, I think more people are negative about it because of... Um, not necessarily pay-per-views, but just certain things, whether it's seen as push, ECW, uh, you know, DX being a little bit more family friendly. King Booker's another one. You know, that's definitely another one. Uh, obviously, ECW on sci-fi, just the whole the whole way ECW went with, you know, how bad the show was at times. And then you trickle it down all the way to the awful December to dismember with, uh, you know, Bobby Lashley becoming uh, ECW champion. Uh, I mean, the list goes on. You can make a list. You can make a laundry list about things from 2006 that sucked, uh, that had nothing to do with the pay-per-views. But um, let me say this first before we get going here. I, I, I was trying to think about this. And so, so this is Benoit's return from the sabbatical. And, and I, I remember this like it was yesterday, you know, right before No Mercy. Uh, you know, Vince Vince McMahon was actually on Bite This, and, uh, you know, they were interviewing him. One of the questions was, you know, what's the update on Benoit? Is he coming back? And, uh, you know, Vince was just like, you know, Benoit's uh, in training right now. Little did we know he was going to be on the pay-per-view, you know, that, that week. 
Um, and he, he, I just remember him saying, you know, sometimes we need to enjoy the fruits of our labor. And, you know, he needed to take time off to heal some wounds. And, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. It's, it's really, really funny. I, I mean, looking back on it now, I, I kind of... You know, I think the damage was already done. I'm not going to say, oh, you know, Ben Wash should have just stayed at home and everything would have been fine. You know, that's not always the answer. Staying at home and staying off the road, I, I don't know if it's always the answer. Maybe Benoit got even worse, you know, by taking even more time off that summer. Um, but hey, man, the bottom line is, uh, you know, Benoit returns on this show. I, I think... You know, you could make the argument that they really missed out by not promoting, you know, Ben Wada return. It's almost like, well, why wouldn't you promote him the return? You could have gotten, you know, at least 10,000 more people to order this show. There, there are people out there that, that love Ben Wada's work, that will watch his work, that don't even like the WWE. So I thought it was kind of a missed opportunity, um, you know. You know, they even promoted RVD's return in 2013. And, you know, that it was so well promoted that you almost feel like Money in the Bank 2013, you know, got that extra jump, got that extra boost just because of how, how well they promoted it. So, I don't know. That's one of the things that have always bothered me. I just don't think they really ever treated Benoit like the star that, you know, he deserved to be treated as. Uh, you could definitely make the case here. But when you when you see the way this show unfolds, and I, I'm, I listened to the podcast with Bruce, there was some... Last minute decision making here. Uh, originally, they wanted Benoit to feud with MVP, uh, but they decided to save it for obviously WrestleMania, uh, which was definitely the right call. You can't have MVP debut and then Benoit debut as well and have one of them lose. That that I just think that's bad business. So if you look at the way they booked Regal here, Regal was involved in a lot of shenanigans here with Booker T and with Vito and whole bunch of other fun stuff and uh you know the story was that regal was having like the worst night of his life and you know him wrestling benoit benoit would make him look like a bloody mess and it it just added to the to the blow off of this whole you know booker and, and regal you know trying to you know o o almost trying to you know figure out a way to get booker t to retain the belt in the in the main event and uh it, it worked out well so if you want to argue to me that, you know, the, the Regal opponent should have been a surprise because of just the way the show unfolded, I'm cool with that. But, you know, once again, I, I just think Benoit is such a he's such an awesome wrestler. And, and once again, he steals the show here with with Regal. One of the this combination was just, you know, a match made in heaven. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but, you know, Benoit always got the best out of Regal. This just felt like a war. Um, and it's, it's probably the worst match out of the three, but it, it was still friggin' awesome. Still the match of the night, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but let's get right down to it, man. First match on the, to open up the show, we got Matt Hardy taking on Gregory Helms. All right, so Hel Helms at the time is the Cruiserweight champion. Uh, the, the title's not on the line. Uh, he hadn't lost a pay-per-view match all year, and he's still the champion. So this is a non-title match. Uh, I didn't think that was that predictable that they, um, you know, that, that JBL actually, you know, read that off, that he's undefeated on pay-per-view. Um, you know, to me, that doesn't give away the match at all. It just it just kind of added to, you know, his uh, resume and ju just the underrated great year that I think Gregory Helms, uh, you know, had. You know, I, I think is this is definitely a step up from Hurricane. When he was Hurricane on Raw, you know, facing La Resistance in tag matches, I don't know. I just, I never really saw Hurricane as someone, you know, you wanted to watch over and over again, especially in the tag team situation with the superhero in training. So I just think this is a, you know, more of a humanized, you know, version of Gregory Helms. And, you know, I, I, I think he was good here. You know, he's wrestling Matt Hardy. These two guys have a lot of history together. I believe, um, you know, the Hardys had their own promotion uh, in Carolina called Omega. And, uh, you know, Helms was was heavily involved with that, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but, yeah, you know, the crowd was hot, was hot for Matt Hardy. I, I think they had good chemistry. It felt like they knew each other well. Lots of creativity. A lot of great near falls here. A lot of great, you know, schoolboys, uh, counters. Just a lot of great action. Side effects. Uh, Helms' uh, moveset is really underrated. His kicks are really underrated rated as well. I, th I thought he looked great here. He was, a, he was a solid cruiserweight champion, even though, you know, that, that title, like, they, di they, didn't, they didn't promote it as well as they could have. 
but it was still a solid rain. There's no doubt about it. Matt Hardy actually does go over. I think he gets Iris whipped into the referee. He sees it coming, and then you know he's able to hit the twist of fate on Helms. Awesome finish right there. Underrated match. You know, I, to I totally forgot how good this was. Um, I will say this, though. Um, for as good as it was, you know, I, I got to say, I think Matt definitely lost some steam. Um, it, you know, for as good as the match was, I, like, I didn't say to myself, oh, you're like, Matt Hardy should be, uh, you know, main eventing. Like, I just, it just didn't really, the, the match really didn't explain to me that Matt, you know, was clicking on all cylinders in terms of, uh, you know, Mike Skills, charisma, and, you know, where it was at the time. But it was just, it was just a nice little friendly match. Uh, you know, th definitely the, the surprise of the night, the match that I probably forgot, you know, more than anything from this show. Uh, next up we have... Brian Kendrick and Paul London taking on Casey James and uh, Idol Stevens. We got Ashley Massaro coming out there to support Kendrick and London. And then we got Michelle McCool uh, supporting Casey James and uh, Idol Stevens. So you, you, at, at this time, you're seeing Diva Search girls all over the place, whether it's 2004 Diva Search, 05 Ashley Massaro. Uh, 2006 with Layla. I mean, they're they're just everywhere. I mean, I mean, Vince could have uh, you know ran a strip club at this time. I think it was uh, was it Road Dog that said that in TNA. He's like, you know, why don't you go back to that strip club you got fired from? To uh, Christy Hemi. Um, but hey, man, this was a lot of fun. You know, if anyone forgets, uh, Idol Stevens is actually um, you know Damian Sandow. You know, it, it, it hit me. So I said to myself, man, that kind of looks a little bit like Damian Sandow. I, I I actually went on Wikipedia just to check it, and if you click on Idol Stevens on this show, it takes you right to Damian Sandow's uh, Wikipedia homepage. So that that was pretty cool. Um, I think KC James and Idol Stevens. I don't remember them at all, really. I I really I, you know now that I watched it back, it, it definitely sounds familiar. You know, this is just one tag team that, you know, I just have not a lot of memory of. Um, but it was solid stuff, though, man. The highlight here is I just think Kendrick and London, you know, all of their big moves just came across, you know, awesome. I, I think what, what hurt the match was, you know, the, the diva stuff on the outside. I, I think it, it was a little bit distracting. It didn't totally ruin the match, though. It, it, it was a little bit distracting. Uh, I got to mention this, uh, JBL, man, he, he really loved, uh, Michelle McCool. And, uh, you know, how many times did JBL say that's the next Mrs. Layfield? Uh, you know, thank God, like this stuff happened before. I think she started dating Undertaker, but, um, but Hey, you know, I, th this is where Michelle McCool met Taker. They were on SmackDown for years. You know, Taker was always on SmackDown for whatever the reason, uh, at this time, so this is where they probably met. But uh, but I got to shout out Kendrick and London, man. That they, they did some a, a lot of just torpedoes, just double team moves where they're just you know sending each other off like missiles. The ending here is really really sweet with London doing a shooting star press off the top of uh, you know Kendrick's back for the finish. They actually called it a Northern Light. I, I, I just you know what it, it, I don't remember that that they called that move the Northern Light when you when you hear the word Northern Light you think of the suplex but uh, I gotta say here man this this was good stuff I, I mean I, I like the idea of putting Ashley with them it's almost like um, you know putting Lita with the Hardys it definitely has like that punk rocker type of feel okay next up we got uh, the Miz Mike Mizani coming out uh, at twenty he's twenty six. On this show, uh, I think it's his birthday. He comes out there. Uh, Layla is about to give him a, uh, a strip tease. Once again, this is a, you know we got we got very very similar to a strip club, uh, the WWE in in, in two thousand six. Um, I gotta say, uh, Layla, holy shit, man! Uh, this was TNA right here. This this was good stuff. Um, you almost forget how hot she was. Um, you know, she's a former Miami. Miami Heat dancer, um, so you know she's you know she's in shape if she's gonna uh, you know be a part of the uh, Miami Heat and uh, that Pat Riley diet where he's measuring guys' body fat. But um, yeah, man, she she gave a nice little show. You forget how amazing her ass was, and she had uh, great tits as well. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, obviously with Layla, I never really cared. Um, you know, for a lot of these diva search girls in the ring. But this was definitely a hot segment. Uh, you also had um, a nice little surprise with the Miz uh, getting blindfolded, and then all of a sudden the um, 
God damn, the, the, the fat guy with the bikini comes out. I, I think he called himself, oh, Big Dick Johnson. Big Dick Johnson comes out. And, and when Miz takes off the blindfold, uh, he gets all disgusted. But uh, it was a nice little prank by Layla. Um, fun little segment right there. I mean, what really stood out is just how hot Layla was. You just almost forget, um, you know, how hot some of these girls were. Uh, you know, <laughs> but I will say this, though, man. If you had, I, I don't remember if this is true. In 2005 and 2006, if they gave that much TV time to the Diva Search that they did in 2004, if they did, man, that sucks. Because they gave the, the Diva Search in 2004 way too much TV time. And, and you got to remember, Raw was only two hours uh, in 2004. Um, but next up, we have the debut of MVP, Montel Vontavious Porter. Uh, he's taking on uh, Marty Garner. I, I had no idea who this guy was. Uh, this this guy looked uh, like even less of a star than Marty Jannetty on uh, drugs. So that's pretty bad. I I I I don't know who this guy came from. But but clearly, I don't think this was the pan plan. I, I think they definitely toyed with the idea of uh, you know doing MVP and Benoit. Uh, MVP comes out. He gets a lot of Power Ranger chance. Tons of Power Ranger chance. Uh, gets on the mic, cuts a you know, cuts a decent promo, and um, you know, I, I I like MVP. I think MVP um, is going to do great in AEW. He uh, he's actually going to be wrestling Josh Barnett at uh, Bloodsport in November, so you know, they they built that up really nicely at the last Bloodsport show. I, I don't know how many people are going to really get into that. Um, I don't know if MVP is perfect for that style, but hey, you know, I think in, I'm looking more forward to MVP and AEW. I think AEW is really going to give him the platform, you know, to really have the green light, you know, on the mic. Um, you know, this version of MVP on SmackDown, I, I think it was OK, but I, I, I was never really crazy about him in the ring. I was never crazy about MVP when he turned babyface. But hey, you know, the, I think. Part of the part of the plan was to kind of give him a weak opponent and just to kind of make him look like, you know, he needs a lot of work. He needs a lot of help in the ring. I, I think part of the gimmick was that, you know, he needed to be toughened up. But guys like Regal and Benoit, if, if you go to the Regal and Benoit match, uh, JBL is crapping on MVP the whole match saying, you know, MVP has got to he's got to feel what it's like to be in the ring with these guys. Even the Miz, too. Like it's kind of taking shots at some of the newer guys on SmackDown that they have no idea what they're in for, if they ever get into the ring with guys like Regal and Benoit with, with the way the match was going. Okay, next up we have uh, The Undertaker taking on Mr. Kennedy. Uh, believe the first match of their, you know, pay-per-view series here. You know, they wrestled at, uh, you know, No Mercy right here. They had the rematch of Survivor Series where, you know, Kennedy took that gunshot of a uh, chair shot. Uh, you definitely remember that. And then I think at Armageddon, they had the uh, the last ride match. So I, I remember this Taker and Kennedy stuff, you know, being pretty good. I, I actually liked the match. I, I, I didn't think it was that bad. All right, so the argument against this thing, let's just get this out of the way. Um... It was, it was very methodical, methodical, slow and boring. You, you could definitely argue that, you know, if, if you're not a big fan of Taker having these, you know, really long matches that are a little bit slow, um, you know, th this might not be your cup of tea. And once again, I think Kennedy was a little bit exposed here. Um, th there, you know what, I, I was thinking about uh, Kennedy's finishers. You know, obviously he can't get Taker up for that inverted Samoan drop. I mean, that would have been too tough of a task with how big taker is so you know he really you know could have used some better finishers i, I don't remember exactly what he used I, I think eventually he started using like a version of a flatliner which it feels like everybody uses that but yeah i definitely think kennedy needed a better finisher here it's it just the, the offense from him was just boring and generic like there was it was it was good i mean he was able to survive he was able to stay away from takers you know, offense here, he was, you know, even some of the simplest offense, you know, Kennedy was able to dodge, whether it be the last ride, the choke slam. Um, he actually exposed the turnbuckle, you know, just to just to keep himself alive here. Um, but hey, you know, there really wasn't a lot of impressive stuff from Kennedy's uh, arsenal in terms of combat skill. And, and I just think it hurt the match a little bit. And, and there wasn't one point where I said to myself, oh, all right, you know, Kennedy has a chance of actually, you know, winning this match. Uh, one of the other problems with the match was you could smell the DQ like a mile away. Um, you know, they actually teased, you know, that Unforgiven 2002, uh, 
you know, disqualification spot where, you know, the referee is like trapped by the turnbuckle. And I thought the ref was going to call for a DQ. A lot of times where, you know, you know, Taker almost hits the ref. So this had, you know, I was just, this is one of those matches that I was just rooting not to be a DQ because it felt like it was going to be a DQ. And then eventually Kennedy brings the United States Championship into the ring. Uh, Taker intercepts it. The referee is begging Taker not to use it. And he still uses it. So, uh... The match ends in a DQ after 20 minutes. Uh, but hey, I still liked it, though. I, I think Kennedy was able to to hang in there. You know, I, I think for as unspectacular as Kennedy looked here, I actually liked the video package. He was actually a little bit serious in the video package, just cutting, you know, solid promos on Taker. Very, you know... I would definitely say that they were very serious. They had a nice tone to them. Um, it didn't feel like Kennedy was overacting and acting annoying or acting like an asshole uh, like he usually does. So there was, a, there was a lot to like here in terms of, uh, you know, Kennedy trying to, you know, morph into more of a serious contender because, you know, they're trying to get him ready, you know, to win the money in the bank and, and possibly win the ch championship if, if, if he didn't get injured. Um, so there we go with that. But uh, but I will say this about Kennedy, though. I, I I definitely think he, you know, if you want to argue that he's in the same boat as guys uh, like L.A. Knight or, or guys like, um, you know, even Joe Hendry, who's going to be main eventing Bound for Glory, um, you know, this weekend. Like he, he he's definitely, you know, you know, I, I think more. Along those lines, in a guy that's a little bit less stubs, substance and more of a, a personality or entertainer, and uh, you know that's exactly what Kennedy did, man. He was he was able to, you know, I'll give Kennedy uh, credit, man. He he was definitely original. I, I think him, you know, cutting promos as if he was an announce an announcer. It, it's something that we hadn't seen before, and a lot of people definitely did get behind it. Um. And I think Vince was a big fan of Kennedy. You know, I, I think for a lot of reasons. I think he liked his charisma. I think he definitely, um, I, I think Vince definitely does cater guys that are Irish, like the guy, like Finley, like Kennedy, because, you know, Vince is Irish. So I think, you know, I'm not going to say he's biased towards Irish guys, but it's just, you know, I, I would just look at it as kind of like an added bonus. But, you know, Taker does his job here. Uh, I, I think it was kind of a chore to sit through uh, after 20 minutes, but... It was still pretty good stuff, and it just kind of, you know, escalated the feud. Once again, Taker's going to have an, another feud with another guy that's trying to make a name for himself off of The Undertaker. And, uh, you know, it is what it is right here. So, uh, match was not bad. Definitely not bad. You know, if, you know, some people are going to crap on this match because it's a little bit slow. But in a way, though, I, I kind of like, you know, matches where it's allowed to unfold and, and take its time. So... I'm, a, I'm, I'm actually going to be a little bit more generous to this match than I think some people are. Okay, next up we have another Rey Mysterio and Chavo Guerrero match. This is uh, Falls Count Anywhere. Uh, so leading up to this thing, Vicky had turned on Rey. You know, didn't like the fact that Rey was, um, you know, using Eddie's death. A um, whole bunch of different stuff to get into. But, uh, but you know, that's the bottom line. Vicky... Uh, was basically telling Rey Mysterio that she's he's just an insignificant part of uh you know Vicky's past and Eddie's past so um yeah I think a lot of people were kind of fed up with uh you know using Eddie Guerrero in the storylines at this time someone in the front row had a sign that said you know just let Eddie rest in peace um I could definitely agree with that but at the same time I, I think you know Vince you know wanted to take care of Vicky and um you know, why not just challenge himself and, you know, try to make a star out of Vicky. And you definitely see Vicky do a lot more heel stuff here, a lot of screaming and yelling. And she was a natural. She was definitely good at it. And uh, obviously over the years, you know, Vince really worked with her and tweaked her to the point where Vicky became, you know, a valuable commodity. There's no doubt about it. So, uh, yeah, we get another Ray and Chavo match. This is one of my favorite matches from Ray and Chavo. Um, it's just not in the ring enough. It definitely felt like they were working around the injury. Uh, I think Ray needed to have knee surgery at this time. And, and for whatever the reason, this must have been on SmackDown, but I thought this match ended with just Chavo uh, taking a chair and just whacking the shit out of Mysterio's knee, and then Mysterio needs knee surgery, and then he's out until, uh, you know, SummerSlam. 
Um, they must have done that on SmackDown, you know, maybe the week the week after this. I think maybe in L.A., if I'm not mistaken. But here we go, man. Ray and Chavo. Um, all right. So one of the other ch arguments were about Chavo. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't think Chavo ever really expected to be a big star. You know, this is, you know, Chavo's getting a push here, but it's not the Mysterio push, you know, going going into WrestleMania 22. But, you know, not for one second do I think Chavo was jealous of Ray, like in real life about, you know, you know, being the one to, you know, win the Rumble and uh, go on to pay tribute to uh, to Eddie. Um, I, I mean, I, I get the point. Like if, you know, Chavo is more of a blood relative uh, you know, compared to Ray. So why not just go with Chavo? I, I just think Mysterio is more, much more marketable. Um, I think he's definitely a better wrestler. Um, you know, I think he's a bigger star. It, it, you know, so so you, you, you can't you can't say to me like, oh, Chavo should have got the spot over Ray. I just think that's ridiculous. I never really thought about it like that. But um, yeah, I, I just think Chavo makes for a great heel as well. I, I, I definitely think he does. Um you know, you knew he was going to turn on Ray eventually. He turned on Ray, I think, at Great American Bash. And that, that's how Booker T won the belt. Uh, but, you know, you saw Chavo turn on Eddie. You get to see Chavo turn on Ray and uh, made all the sense in the world. I, I don't think Chavo ever saw himself as someone that was ever going to win the Royal Rumble. So let's just be clear about that. But, yeah, the false count anywhere match, um, the positives about this match to me were, you know, it's very similar to, I think, some of Ray's stuff from ECW. If, if you go back to some of Ray's ECW stuff against Psychosis and Hoover 2 Guerrero, like a lot of those matches were, you know, in the parking lots, uh, you know, off of the balconies in the crowd. Um, so it definitely kind of reminded me of that because they were in the crowd like maybe 10 minutes out of the 12 here. Um the crowd was good too. Like a lot of the crowd was really into it because, you know, they're right by the action. So I really enjoyed that. It actually did get a good reaction. I don't know what the reaction was like throughout the rest of the building. Um, it probably came off a little bit boring. Like if you weren't right on top of the action here and it was just pretty, you know, simple, like just a lot of Irish whips, you know, let's just throw each other into the guardrails. Uh, but you know, the highlight here is Mysterio's big spots, you know, came off great. You know, the hurricanrana in the crowd came off great. He was able to hit him with the six one nine, the senton splash, and then he, he actually does another dive off the top of the balcony uh, to put Chavo away. The, the ending here with the pin, it seemed like they kind of botched it a little bit, but Vicky comes out, starts screaming at Ray, so definitely sets up a rematch. But I thought it was fun. But to me, like you know, Mysterio and Chavo, they're so beautiful to watch in the ring together um, that, you know, this, this just isn't going to be one of my favorite matches. But it was it was still pretty damn good. And, and it, it did kind of bring back memories of, uh, you know, ECW Mysterio. So not the worst thing in the world. But I can completely understand if, you know, the match disappointed you. I, it looks like some people were underwhelmed by this. I don't necessarily disagree with that. I, I could see people finding it underwhelming. I wasn't blown away by it. Okay, next up, this is what we're here for. Chris Benoit taking on William Regal. Uh, before we get to the match, man, Regal is um this is this is the 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 highlight of Regal's career on pay-per-view. Uh he has the match of the night plus he's involved in uh you know some of the best skits I think uh on the show as well. It's it's definitely a great show. If you're a fan of Regal the character and Regal the wrestler, uh the show is right up your alley. So all you guys in the UK that love Regal, uh, you know, definitely check the show out if it, you know, went under the radar. But yeah, man, you know, Regal did some fun stuff here. So he he's basically you know, some of the show kind of reminded me of King of the Ring 2001. And, you know, with, with Austin and Regal as well, where Austin's like paranoid because he wants Vince to show up. Here, Booker T is paranoid because he wants Regal to reason with Finley and, and talk Finley into helping him in the main event. So that's going on throughout the whole show. He's almost being like a messenger for Booker T. And then there's all these uh, funny shenanigans as well. So he does this segment with Vito. Uh, Vito's actually wearing a dress and uh, Regal ends up being naked and his facial expressions when he sees Vito's Johnson, you know, he starts freaking out and, you know, I, I, I get, and then Regal is actually uh, somewhat naked here. He's w walking out of the building. Uh, apparently on the live pay-per-view, there is a shot of Regal's penis 
and WWE had to apologize for it. And then you get to see Regal's ass, which was actually blurred out on the DVD, so you weren't able to see it on DVD or on the network. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, what really stood out here was Regal's, you know, facial expressions. This is just pure, you know, Regal comedy. You know, very similar to when Regal uh, and Jericho did the the pissing in the tea thing. You know, that was funny as well. But this this was definitely good stuff. And then they, um, you know, after the match with Benoit, um, you know, Regal gets the last laugh and just slaps Booker T in the face. Uh, so that's how Regal's night ends right there. But yeah, I, you know, I, I guess the story is Regal is being humiliated, you know, the whole night. He's getting caught naked and Vito's laughing at him. And, you know, um, Teddy Long is yelling at him as well, telling him to get to the ring. Your your opponent's going to be a surprise. And uh, little do we know, Chris Benoit is going to be his opponent. So Regal's night gets even worse as he's going to face the guy that brings the best out of him and is going to make him work the hardest. So uh, Benoit and Regal go out there and just have a war, man. It's just, it's awesome stuff. All right, so, you know, obviously it's brutal. I think most people know it's going to get bloody. You know, Benoit is going to chop the shit out of him. He's going to headbutt the crap out of him. He's going to split Regal open. Um, you know, and, and, and definitely the, the blood for that segment between Regal and Booker T, it definitely worked. You know, because Booker T was calling him pathetic. He's like, look at you. You got blood on your face. You look pathetic. Um, so that's the argument for having Benoit be a surprise because of, you know, everything that went on here with Regal. But, man, uh, it was awesome, though, man. It, it was awesome stuff. But the, the underrated thing about this match is the submission work from Regal. Regal was really able to do some good grappling here, some great submission work. You know, even some of the submissions to, to counter Benoit's submissions were just really well laid out. You know, the, um, the abdominal stretch, the Regal stretch, and then, obviously, the front face guillotine face lock where he's pulling back on it. You just saw some great submission work here. Uh, but God damn it, man, that, that chop to Regal's face was brutal as hell. And Benoit just German suplexed, uh, you know, Regal to death here. Uh, Benoit was bleeding from the mouth as well. So this this is just a slugfest. It's probably the weakest of the WWE trilogy. So if anyone forgets, they had the match. It's on Benoit's DVD. It feels like a WWE match, but the Brian, Brian Pillman Memorial Show, um, I don't think that was an official WWE show. Um, I think, you know, I think most people would agree that was the best work together. Uh, the match on Velocity is is just a gem. I, I, I love that match. That is definitely a gem. It's on it's on Velocity, though. Um, I, you know, it wasn't on the network a couple years ago, but I think it is now. So if you want to go back and check it out, it's from like the middle of July, maybe July 17th on Velocity. Um, yeah. Yeah. When I first saw that, I was just like, holy shit, I can't believe they're they're having this style of a match on Velocity, which is like the Sunday Night Heat for SmackDown, if you haven't seen it yet. And then and then you got this match right here. So I, I will say this. I, I think in, in some of the other matches, it felt like Regal was able to fight back a little bit harder with knee strikes. And you just you just got to see a repertoire at a Regal that you wouldn't normally see. Here, it just felt like Benoit just, you know, destroyed him. Um, with just chops and German suplexes. Uh, but it was still cool, though, man. Uh, you know, Benoit is able to counter, you know, Regal's submission at the end. He hits a uh, beautiful dragon suplex, and then Regal taps out as soon as the crossface is locked in. So, awesome match. Great way to bring Benoit ma back. I, I, I do wish it could have been promoted. Um, you know, Benoit was out for a long time. I mean, he's, he was out since Judgment Day, and, you know, we're almost five months, you know, into Benoit's sabbatical. So, but hey, man, if you want to argue to me that it was a nice surprise, you could get people to buy the DVD and check out the replay, um, then I'm cool with that. And plus, I think I think Benoit and Regal definitely created some, you know, unexpected buzz, you know, coming out of the show. So if you look at the DVD, it's not even on the back of the DVD. God, we, I mean, what a treat this was, man. Uh, you know, definitely the match of the night. Um, for as good as it was, though, I, I, I would actually rank this last out of the three ones from WWE. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say this was even better than Benoit versus Finley from Judgment Day. Uh, but God damn it, man. It was uh, definitely something to see if you haven't seen it. And on to the main event. We have uh, King Booker defending the belt against Bobby Lashley, Batista, and Finley. A uh, fatal four-way match. Yeah, so this is a four-way that Booker T actually shows up for. If you remember, a No Surrender 2008, uh, the Hurricane... Uh, 
not Gregory Helms, but you know, there was a hurricane and Booker T couldn't make that show. You know what? If if that I hate to say this, and I, I hate to say it, but imagine if that had happened for this show. You know, he would have gotten punished for it. You know, Vince would have been really upset. He would have been said, "I told you to get here on time." I'm sure something like that would have happened. But hey, you know, I, I think at that time, you know, you could make the argument that TNA was just lucky to have Booker T, and you could get away with a lot more stuff there. But um, no disrespect to TNA, man. Uh, let's get let's get on to this fatal four way. I thought it was good. I, I think it was really really good stuff. You know, Finley. You know, Finley. He's in there to help Booker T in the storyline. But at the same time, he basically told Booker T, I'm here for a fight and I'm here to take your world title. So that has Booker T a little bit paranoid. So I, I thought Finley was great here. Underrated worker. Um, you know, in real life, he's really in there just to make this thing go smoothly. It's it's an ideal situation because you got a, you got a guy that is a great worker. And plus, you know, he's working backstage as an agent. So you got a meshing of just two worlds and uh it helps so much to have a guy like finley in this match especially with someone that's a little bit green like bobby lashley or someone that's a little bit lethargic at times like batista he could definitely bring the best out of them in terms of knowing how to pace this match you know i i, I would almost compare this to like blocking in an acting class just by the way you have to structure this because you know th th this did get off to a slow start i mean when you got four guys in there you really have to kind of, you know, minimize, you know, the parts of this match where all four guys are in there at the same time. It just feels cluttered and clunky. So you definitely needed the space this thing out and it worked out really well. This just ended up being just a lot of one on one stuff. And uh, the stuff between Lashley and Finley was awesome. Uh, you know, Finley was just a thorn in Lashley's side that whole year. And they continued that. Just some great near falls there with the shillelagh and the little bastard and you know, Lashley having to fight out of that. I thought Batista looked good here. Batista was the most over guy who's treated like a star. His comeback at the end was dominant. You know, he's just giving everybody a spine buster or the Batista bomb. And, you know, give him credit. He had the crowd rocking. I really thought Batista lost a lot of momentum at this time. But it didn't really it wasn't that transparent on this show. I think Batista looked really good. Oh um, yeah. I, I got to say, you know, Booker T at this time, good victory for him. But, you know, you, you could kind of see this coming a mile away. You know, he's just going to get a, uh, you know, a victory here just by the skin of his teeth. It's just one of those very similar to the way Jericho won uh, that scramble match. He, he's, he basically gets an arm over, um, you know, Finley after Finley gets Batista bombed and, um, you know, Lashley's able to hit the spear on Batista to, you know, get him out of the ring. So that opens up for Booker just to get a nice little victory there. But hey, but Booker T looked good here. I, I think Booker did a good job as a heel, you know, being paranoid. Um, you know, very similar to the way they booked Austin at, uh, at King of the Ring. Very, very similar finish as well with him being paranoid the whole show, wanted Vince's help. In this situation, Booker wants Finley's help. Doesn't really end up getting it, but he's still able to you know, get the job done just barely. And uh, yeah, pretty good show right here. Underrated show um, in 2006. I, I got to say this, this was probably one of the more consistent, you know, SmackDown pay-per-views I think we've ever seen, you know, from the opener all the way to the main event, everything was pretty much consistent. You know, the only thing on the show that I, I think is skippable is the MVP stuff. That's really it. I mean, the, 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 the most polarizing match of the night for, I think everybody out there, is going to be Kennedy and, and, and Taker. You know, if, if if you don't like slow, methodical matches, then you're probably not going to like that match. But you, I definitely think you can make the argument for it because it got time. It was allowed to unfold. It had DQ written on it a mile away. You could see the DQ coming, you know, before it even happens. I still think it was a quality match, though. But I end it right there, guys. That's No Mercy 2006. Pleasant surprise. A lot better than I thought it would be. I, I'll be completely honest with you. And some of you guys are telling me that. You know, don't forget about No Mercy 2006. You know, that was a quality show as well. So really, I mean, when you look at 2006 in terms of pay-per-views, I guess really the only show you could consider bad is Survivor Series. I mean, I reviewed Survivor Series last year, and I got to say, it, it, it definitely felt like the company, you know, fell off big time when when you compare Survivor Series 06 to the last couple of ones. 
Um, but is is that really? I wouldn't really count December to this member as a WWE pay per view. I think that's unfair. Armageddon, I remember being really good. It was actually a fun show. It actually did much better than No Mercy in terms of, you know, buy rates. Um, but yes, yeah, Cyber Sunday would be another one. You know, so, you know, so they got rid of Taboo Tuesday and they transitioned to Cyber Sunday, which did really well. The move to Sunday actually got them a better buy rate. Um, they put Booker T and Big Show uh, in the main event. You know, it was like a tri-branded uh, triple threat match with all the championships. Not at stake. I, th- I think the fans had a vote for whose championship was going to be at stake and it ended up being Booker T's championship. But I don't know. I don't really have great memories of that show, though. So that, that might be another bad show from 06. But that's pretty much it. I think every other show from 06... <laughs> You know, was pretty much quality. Like even New Year's Revolution, that's that's probably a weak undercard. But I think I definitely think it was probably a step up from '05, and um, it's it's got my favorite mark out moment ever. So I'm not going to say that uh, you know '06 was an awful year for pay per views. I think I think this, even though Mercy 2006, I think it really does prove that it was it was a pretty pretty consistent year, you know, for pay per views.